In last week's video, I talked about the importance of mise-en-scene. This week, I want to take a deeper dive into what that means for your work, to explore more of what film can teach us about photography as we talk about the art of blocking. What is the least visually interesting thing that you can think of? Perhaps for you it's a landscape, maybe it's still life, or a street scene where two people are just talking. And yet those scenarios have made some of the most visually stunning and critically acclaimed pieces of art in the world. Nowhere is this more important than in film, where the art of directing requires you to take the mundane and imbue it with meaning. This is one of the key factors of visual storytelling. And if you can get a handle on it, something that can elevate your photography to new heights. In this set of videos, I want to start talking about the techniques that film directors employ to develop their sense of mise-en-scene, and to make sure that everything in the final movie tells the audience about what's going on through context and subtext. I also want to talk about how you can employ those same techniques in your photography. Perhaps the first thing to understand is blocking. At face value, this could be just where you place your actors in a scene, but actually it's much more important than that. The placement of not just the actors, but the props and even the scenery in a frame can convey a message. And I'm going to be talking about frames here and not films or scenes as such, because as photographers, we have to convey that same message in a single image. We don't have the luxury of camera movement or scripted dialogue. Whatever we want to bring to our shots has to be there in the moment, at the click of a button. But it doesn't mean that we don't have time to choose our locations, arrange our space if needed, or arrange ourselves in relation to the space that we're in. And this is where the true meaning of blocking comes into the mix. Because blocking is really about the relationship between different objects. Let's talk for a moment about context and subtext as an example. Uh, the following is a still from Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. In it, you will see the Droogs. Now, I'm going to be talking about Kubrick a lot, in part because he was a meticulous filmmaker whose sense of visual storytelling made him one of the greatest directors in cinema, and partly because he started life as a photographer. And it's sometimes easier to see through his compositions how you can use the same method in yours. In this scene, Alex, who is the leader of the Droogs, who's the one in the middle with the bowler hat, is being challenged. Whilst the scene is basically a conversation, even this simple shot shows us the relationship between the characters. Alex is being challenged by Georgie, the Droog with the bowler hat on the left. You can see this in Georgie's positioning. He's leaning down over Dim, who's the one sitting beneath him. And Dim has just laughed, indicating his agreement with Georgie, and so directly challenging Alex's superiority. And whilst all eyes are on Alex, look at where your eyes are drawn, towards Dim, because of the compositional lines of the shot. Look at the shadows, the angle of the cane. All of those shapes make up lines that draw your eyes towards Dim, and this is an artistic choice, which is giving you the subtext of the scene. Whilst the context is four people standing around talking, the positioning of actors and the props within the scene is showing you the interpersonal relationships and power dynamics within the group. Now, let's look at a scene from Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. This is a e fantastic example of blocking done well to convey meaning. We start with a boy playing in the snow, and as the camera pulls back, we see his parents arguing over what's going to happen to him. By placing the mother large in front of the frame, we can see that the dynamic of the shot is showing us that her opinion is the one that matters. His father, on the other hand, is protesting what's happening, but he's further back. He's dwarfed by the mother in the shot. The visuals are telling us that his opinion on this matter is not important. And finally, we have the person for whom these decisions are going to matter the most, framed smallest of all, oblivious to the decisions that are being made for him. Both Hitchcock and Kubrick are using three elements in their composition to guide your eye, to indicate the relationship between people and objects. 
and those are space, shapes, and lines. They're the geometry of the scene, if you will. And you've probably heard about leading lines before. Well, we're seeing the same concept played out. Let's look at this last frame from Citizen Kane again. What we're actually looking at here is a triangle, and the point of the triangle is focused on the mother. Everything points towards her, much like the lines in our clockwork orange scene showed everything pointing towards Dim. So then, this is what we have to look out for in our scenes. And you're either going to arrange that if you're working with models, for example, or you're going to look for times when that is naturally occurring. Let's think about space. If you were to compose an image with foreground interest, what is that actually telling you about the shot? Is it conveying a message? And if not, is there anything that you can do to change that? One of the things that we react well to is repetitions in nature. Can our foreground interest become a mirror of our subject in some way? Or is it using juxtaposition, which is when two contrasting objects or ideas are placed together in the same frame? The space that they take up shows their relationship to one another. And if you're working with people, well, what's their power dynamic? Is one in a position of control, for example? Uh, placing a subject higher or lower in relation to somebody else in that frame can convey that sort of mentality. Consciously making these decisions when taking a picture imbues that picture with subtextual meaning and means that the way that you approach taking the image is going to change drastically to match what you want to get out of it. Whilst thinking about space, you can also think about shapes. There are three basic geometric shapes, squares, circles and triangles. We saw before in Citizen Kane how a triangle was used to convey meaning within a shot. And this works because humans are very good at seeing patterns in nature and trying to fit them into our understanding of the world. This is why many artists tasked with creating a drawing will start by making out the basic geometrical shapes that make up the image. What you need to know is that this also happens in reverse and you can form shapes within your frame that convey a message. Circles, for example, give us a feeling of safety. They are inclusive. Squares limit the amount of space within a frame. And I often think this is why the one by one grid that Instagram has is actually an interesting compositional idea. But a square within a frame can limit a subject to a certain area, blocking them from accessing another part of the frame or separating them from something that is otherwise important. Again, we're talking about juxtaposition here, we can do, uh, and what's the, what is the square, what's in it, what's outside it, what are we juxtaposing? Triangles, on the other hand, are sharp and aggressive and have a point that, that will send your eyes in a particular direction. And finally, of course, there's lines, and we've already mentioned leading lines, but every line in a shot can have your viewer going off in a different direction. The point of a leading line isn't simply to exist as some sort of interest, but to actually lead your eye towards the subject. In the Clockwork Orange example, we saw how those leading lines can converge on a subject to make them more important in the frame. This is a great way of drawing attention to something smaller in the frame, like, for example, a person who is standing next to a mountain when you would usually just concentrate on the mountain next to them. And the great thing is, you don't even need to have physical lines in order to get this effect. Lines can also convey mood, and the lines that your subject make in relation to one another is another indication of power dynamics within a scene. Now, on their own, these elements might not make a shot particularly meaningful. That all changes when you use these techniques to start telling stories or to convey meaning. When you understand the subtext that you want to create before taking your shots, filmmakers use this subject uh, to reveal the, the stories behind their scenes, the subtext of their scenes. But as a photographer, these are really the only tools that you have to convey any message at all. Make sure it's the message that you want to be sending out. That's it for today's video. Thanks ever so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please give the video a big thumbs up. And of course, if you've got any questions or if you'd like more information or if you'd just like to say hello, then it'd be great if you would leave a comment below as well. 
If you're new here and you'd like to see more of these videos, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button, the little bell icon at the end, and of course the all notifications tab that pops up. And then every time I release a video, you're going to get to see it straight away. Until next time, thanks ever so much for coming along. I hope that you've got something out of these uh, videos. I hope to do more of this sort of uh, mix of, of film techniques that you can use on photography because personally, I think that they are really, really important and that you can learn a hell of a lot uh, from this sort of um, approach to photography. Until next time, of course, thank you for coming along and keep taking those photos. <laughs>